I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. We're talking this hour with zillionaire entrepreneur Nick Hanauer, who says American inequality has now gone too far, that if we don't fix the middle class, the whole thing could come down, maybe blow up his uh, essay in political magazine memo to my fellow zillionaires, says headline, the pitchforks are coming for us plutocrats. New numbers out last week from the Census Department saying inequality higher than ever. This is a pretty hot essay. You write, the problem isn't that we have inequality. Some inequality is intrinsic to any high-functioning capitalist economy. Obviously true. You write, the problem is that inequality as it is at historically high levels and getting worse every day. Our country is rapidly becoming less a capitalist society and more a feudal society. That's provocative. Mm -hmm. And you say, unless our policies change dramatically, the middle class will disappear and we'll be back to late 18th century France before the revolution. Implication yes. being there that we tempt revolution. And it's more than an implication. You're writing that you see pitchforks coming, i.e. upheaval, maybe in the streets. Yes. And to be honest, I wrote this somewhat tongue in cheek. You know, I do not keep my jet fueled at the airport ready to flee the country because I fear unrest at any moment. Mm -hmm. But the numbers are stark and, I think, incontrovertible. In 1980, when Reagan was elected, the top 1% shared about 8% of national income, while the bottom 50% of Americans shared about 18 Fast forward to today, the top 1% now share almost three times as much in the low 20s as a percent of national income. And the bottom 50%, their share has shrunk to 12 or 13 if you simply assume the trend will continue over the next 30 years, although I believe it's accelerating, uh, you know, in another 30 years, the top 1% will share 35% or so of national income, but the bottom 50% will share just six. And I think that that kind of split is likely to destroy uh, the economy, but to say nothing of the democracy. And, you know, I think the whole nation is watching what is unfolding in Ferguson, Missouri today. And I absolutely believe that is kind of what I'm talking about. You know, at the core, this conflagration in Ferguson is about people who have been disenfranchised economically, politically, and socially, and the anger and, you know, disaffection that comes from that. Mm. And I just don't think that it makes any sense for anyone, particularly people like me, to engineer policies that accentuate and extend that gap. I just think it's incredibly short-sighted. Listeners, here, here's what Nick Hanauer writes to his fellow super-rich plutocrats, as he says. He writes, if we don't do something to fix the glaring inequities in this economy, the pitchforks are going to come for us, i.e. super-rich. No society can sustain this kind of rising inequality. In fact, there's no example in human history, Hanauer writes, where wealth accumulated like this and the pitchforks didn't eventually come out. You show me a highly unequal society and I will show you a police state or an uprising. There are no counterexamples, none. It's not if, it's when. You know, Americans have had a more or less steady state uh, civic formula for so long, Nick, that I think many are kind of immune to that kind of thinking. That happens in other countries. That happens in, in France at the time of the revolution. It happens elsewhere. I think a lot of people just feel in their gut, that doesn't happen here. I hope they're right. <laughs> For one second, though, because I think a lot of people look out and wonder why this hasn't been more self-repairing. Some of the things you're observing seem kind of obvious, and yet here we go on. You talk in your essay about the super-rich living in our gated bubble worlds. You say yes. to them, you are living in a dream world. You write, revolutions like bankruptcies come gradually and then suddenly. One day somebody sets himself on fire, then thousands of people are in the streets, and before you know it, the country is burning, and then there's no time for us to get to the airport and jump on our Gulfstream 5s and fly to New Zealand. Is that attitude out there? I mean, are people like, you know, have a runaway islands on Tahiti where they'll go when it hits the fan? Uh, you mean do rich people think yeah. through what their escape route is? Yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, sure they do. <laughs> And to be honest, when yeah. I first started talking about economic inequality and the connection to growth and prosperity five or six years ago, mm -hmm. my peers tended to get incredibly angry and incredibly defensive and felt like that was not a legitimate part of the civic discourse, that any talk of economic inequality was essentially class warfare and off limits okay. in polite society. Yeah. But that has radically changed over the last five years. And I think you would have to, from Seattle, 
fly all the way to Texas, probably, to find an intelligent, thoughtful, wealthy person who does not at least agree that rising economic inequality is an issue that the nation needs to confront and that if it continues to get worse, that's going to be a bad thing for everybody. Now, what to do about it is a very different thing, but virtually all of my peers, the people I talk to, mm -hmm. agree with me today that economic inequality is a problem and a dead end for a capitalist economy because they quite clearly see that if their customers have no money, their businesses will have no customers. They're, it's yeah. not very complicated. It is worrying, and there is simply no doubt that it's going to get worse before it gets better. And you're breeding a generation of people who are detached from the lives of ordinary Americans. I but mean, not detached you know, from if power. You make, if you make $25 million a year, yeah. it is very hard to imagine what life must be like if you earn $25,000 a year. But most people in America earn a lot closer to $25,000 a yeah. year than earn $26 million. Low wage service jobs don't create less value than the middle class manufacturing mm. jobs from former times. Take a barista yep. at Starbucks. Yep. This person is not less well trained than the auto worker who made a good middle class living in the 50s. The only difference, Tom, yep. is power. <laughs> The facts are that auto workers had economic power that was delivered through their union, which enabled them to get a fair split of the value that enterprise created. Hey, Nick, I've Those only got you for half a minute more. Are, the, are your fellow super rich buying this? Because the top 1%, as you remind us, has 20% of the national income now. Ne never mind wealth. If it smells anything like giving up some of that, are they really going to get on board to do this? A few of them will and many of them won't, but it's up to the other 99.8% of Americans to wake up and start to agitate. Nick Hanauer, thanks yeah. very much for being with us this Great. hour. Thank you so much.